Okay, thank you, um, Professor, and thank you all for having me here. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. So I will today be presenting um, some of our work on modeling and prevention of bearing currents in inverter-driven electrical machines. So this is a project, um, most of the work was done in 2016 and I didn't start my timer, and 2017. Um, so this is, most of this work is already like one or two years old now. Um, it's a project that uh, was uh, supported by ABB Corporate Research in Sweden. So we have a bit of a partnership with them. Okay, here's the outline of what I will be talking about today. So, actually the, the longest part of the presentation almost is going to be the introduction, where we talk about um, exactly what is the problem, how does it work, what type of bearing currents um, are there in, in these systems, uh, what, is, what is the mechanisms behind that, and, what, and give a bit of an overview of the different mitigation techniques that we can use to solve the problem. Then I'm going to quickly and go through some modeling of a particular type of shaft voltage, the unipolar or homopolar shaft voltage. And then we'll look into two techniques that we investigated in a bit more detail with the uh, uh, shielding of the winding and also inserting a common mode transformer in the system. And then we'll end off with some conclusions. So in terms of bearing currents the, and the, the problem, the problem is that bearing currents damage bearings. So here we have some images of the type of bearing, bearing current damage that you can typically see where it's due to the currents. So you have this typical fluting pattern. And the way this is works, it's almost, some people have compared it to, um, to spark erosion, almost. It's a really tiny version of that happening inside the bearings um, when there is a, a voltage buildup and they and the bearing is operating in a certain region where the insulating film allows, doesn't allow current to flow. And then when the voltage is high enough and that insulation film is punctured, then you can get some damage. And this mechanism over time can be a serious problem. Of course, like many things, this not, bearing currents aren't really new. So the earliest the people have been observing these things since the 1900s, this type of bearing currents is not what we're talking about here. That's mostly due to asymmetries in the machine. This is maybe not a good example, but it's one example where we have a shaft with a key, and you can see the, the flux lines linking the shaft there. It's not perfectly symmetrical. Most often, maybe if you have some kind of asymmetry in your stator, you can have a net flux linking the shaft, which drives uh, the end-to-end -end shaft voltage, and you can get bearing currents of that. Um, that happens at lower frequencies. What we're talking about here, is bearing currents in the frequency range of say 100 to 100 kilohertz to a couple of megahertz um, caused by the, the common mode voltage of the inverter. So in inverter based systems this common mode voltage that the inverter produces is the problem. Typically it has a peak to peak amplitude equal to the DC bus voltage and the fundamental frequency of it at least depending on the modulation technique is equal to the switching frequency. Um, so here are, are example waveforms of this common mode voltage. And just maybe an easy way to think about this is the standard inverter with three legs, um, it, it, each one of those is going to switch high or low. So there's no way you can sum those three voltages to get zero. If two is high, then you're going to have a, a above zero common mode voltage. Um, in all other combinations, you will get some common mode voltage. Okay, so then if we move on to the, the different types of bearing currents that we get. So what we, the, the situation that we are considering here is we have a common mode voltage applied to the, the winding of the machine, which is illustrated over there, um, and the machine's frame is grounded. So one thing that can happen is because of the capacitive coupling between the winding and the stator core and the winding and the rotor core. It forms a voltage divider which can cause the, so the shaft to become charged. Then if this bearing insulation film breaks down, the, the shaft voltage can discharge through the frame back to ground. 
Okay, so this is the tip, what is typically referred to as EDM bearing currents or electrostatic discharge machining, spark erosion um, type of bearing current. And it's characterized by uh, this homopolar unipolar shaft voltage. Okay. A second scenario can be not due to the, the capacitive coupling between the winding and the rotor, but because of the com common mode current leaking through the stator core. So what happens is the common mode current enters one side of the machine and as it passes along uh, the, the stack length, it leaks through the, through the stator core. And then you can see this, the circles indicate a ring flux that is generated in the machine because of the common mode current at high frequency. This gives us an end-to-end -end shaft voltage, which can drive circulating bearing currents in this path. Okay. A third mechanism that can appear is if for some reason the impedance between the motor frame and ground is sufficiently high, the, fr the, the frame's voltage can be raised. And if the machine is driving something else, which has a, a ground connection, can be whatever, um, then that voltage can discharge through the bearings in the opposite direction, through the coupling, through the driven machine's bearings. And in this way, um, the bearing currents that originate in the machine can also damage whatever the machine is driving. Okay. There are also system aspects that we have to consider. So this is the situation that we, um, when we developed the test setup in our lab, that we used. So on the transformer side, the neutral is grounded. And the capacitance here, so here on the motor side, these, these can be actually the internal capacitances of the motor. So between the, mainly between the winding and the stator core, um, but also the other paths to ground. So if the, if the common mode impedance on this side is very low, then most of the common mode voltage produced by the inverter is going to be seen at the motor side. Um, in some scenarios, you can have the neutral floating of the transformer. And in that, side, in that case, if the motor has a good ground connection, then most of the common mode voltage actually is going to be reflected to the transformer side. And in that case, the, pr the problems will not be nearly as severe because the motor isn't exposed to the high common mode voltage. But if you have more than one inverter in such a system, there's another path for the, uh, a, a common mode ground loop between the two motors, actually, through, through, the, um, through the inverters. So in some cases, the, the common mode voltages from these inverters can, a can cancel each other, but they can also add up. And then we have the same problem, despite the fact that the, the side is floating. OK, so a lot of research has been done into how we can eliminate this problem and to protect the bearings starting from the inverter design. Um, with multi-level inverters, we can apply special switching schemes which eliminate the common mode voltage. Um, and then, of course, the problem with that is that we don't use fully utilize all the switching states of the inverter. Um, another example of that is um, systems where they use so-called dual inverters. So if you drive the machine with two inverters, you connect one to one side of the winding and the other to the other side, if you switch these inverters appropriately, you can actually get the common voltage to cancel. Um, so things like that we can do on the inverter side. Um, of course, we can try to filter this common mode voltage. Uh, one form of that is with a, a, a common mode current choke um, or a transformer. Then one thing that we're going to look at later on, we can try to shield this winding to prevent the, the rotor from becoming charged. Uh, and for the circulating currents, we can even try to, to make sure that the common mode current doesn't leak through the state of core to drive this ring flux, but that it goes out with the shield exactly along the path that it came. Um, of course, we can insulate the bearings. That is a good solution as well if you're just concerned about the motor's bearings. Um, in that case, the shaft can still be charged. Um, through the capacitive coupling, and if that is a problem, you might have to apply a grounding brush. <coughs> in, 
You also you get ceramic bearings with ceramic rolling elements, which is effectively an insulator, and that can also um, those bearings do not suffer from damage due to the currents. Um, so just to observe some of these bearing currents, we've developed a, a test setup in our lab, which you can see there on the left. Um, here are some of the specifications. It's basically just a standard induction machine connected to a, a variable speed drive. The two special things about this bench is these three large resistors here, which form an artificial start point, uh, which we use to measure the common mode voltage that we apply to the machine. And here on this end of the shaft, we have this um, special uh, rotating uh, connection. It's a, uh, it's uh, I think Mercotac is the brand. They, it's a, uh, it's a rotating connection with mercury inside, which forms the electrical connection. So that's a very um, stable way of of having a connection to a rotating shaft. It's it's better than, for example, a carbon brush. Um, or whatever other brush. Um, so those are the two special things about this test bench. And if we can observe some of the of the <coughs> bearing current phenomena. So in blue we have the, the common mode voltage with the scale on the left and in right we have the shaft voltage. This is now only measured on one side. In this case it's a unipolar shaft voltage. Um, and we can see at a number of uh, mo well mostly the, the shaft voltage mirrors the, the common mode voltage. But at a number of um, locations, there's a discharge of the shaft voltage. So you can see it follows the common mode voltage there up to that point and then it discharges. Then it stays at zero. Then it jumps up again with the same rise and then it discharges. So all these discharges, um, that is typically this type of bearing current, what is happening there. Okay, later on we um, we improved our test bench a bit, so we could we added loops um, between the the end shields on either side of the motor and connected that with a small wire, so we can try to measure the the bearing currents, or actually through that wire. This does have a bit of an impact on the actual bearing currents, but in any case, it gives us some indication of what's going on. So here's another set of measurements. Um, we have the common mode voltage, the soft voltage, the common mode current, and then bearing current in one of these uh, loops. So this is a zoomed out view. The next one I'm going to be showing is going to focus in this region between 500 and 600 microseconds. So you can see here we have nicely in in the same frame we have two types of bearing currents happening. So here the common mode voltage is stable and it discharges the shaft voltage and there's a spike in the bearing current. That is the EDM type of bearing current. Then at the common mode voltage transition we have common mode currents flowing and we have current in, uh, uh, bearing currents that precisely mirrors the common mode current. This is a circulating type of bearing current. Okay, so to model the circulating bearing current is a, can be actually quite complex because of all the high frequency impedances that we need to model. Um, so I'm just going to explain to you the uh, a simple model of the unipolar shaft voltages. So Basically, we have a circuit here with three um, terminals. Well, we have the winding, we have the rotor, and we have the frame, which is also connected electrically to the stator core. So there's a large capacitance between the winding and the stator core, the frame. And there's a, a smaller capacitance between the winding and the rotor, and also between the rotor and the frame. Now this, and the bearing is over here. So this circuit forms a voltage divider, and then the bearing voltage is proportional to the common mode voltage and it depends on these capacitances. This is the so-called, the these capacitances is, is the so-called bearing voltage ratio. Um, so from this you can see if we can minimize this winding to rotor capacitance we can reduce the the bearing voltage. So one way we looked to, to do this is to um, put some, insert some kind of shielding in the in the machine um, so if we do that, then the circuit um, representation looks like this. Um, and then the, the bearing voltage is essentially eliminated, ideally, if we can reduce um, this winding to rotor capacitance to zero. Okay. 
So we, in, in the first phase of the project, we investigated two shielding configurations. One where we only shield the end windings. So literature has shown that the, the capacitance in the end winding is actually makes an important contribution to that winding to rotor capacitance, and also uh, a fully shielded rotor. Uh, sorry. Okay, here's the way we implement it. It's a bit back to primary school with some aluminum foil and sticky tape. Um, so you can see the end winding shields there. And we have a connection routed through to the terminal box. So these are the two shields connections that we have. Um, so this is just um, some Nomex paper, with standard kitchen in duct uh, aluminum foil and double-sided tape. And now we've measured the, the common mode voltage and the shaft voltage. So if we, in blue, it's if we don't have shields, if we disconnect those two um, shield connections. Uh, and in green, we have the, the common mode voltage and the shaft voltage if it's shielded. So we can see there's a significant reduction here between the, the blue and the green for the shaft voltage, but it's not completely elim eliminated. Then we moved on to the fully shielded case. Um, we um, insert these strips all along the inner periphery of the stator. Um, again, sticky tape, and in this configuration, we almost completely eliminated the shaft voltage, So, which is what we wanted to see, of course. This is a summary of the results that we achieved there. Um, so you can see initially the, the shaft voltage was around 37 volt, and with the full shields it was um, reduced to a very small value. We tried to um, see if the shielding had some effect on the efficiency, because if we have a, a conductive surface all along our rotor, then we can expect to have some, some currents flowing in the shield. Um, I must say, well, our efficiency test wasn't very precise, but for what it's worth, we did see a, a small drop in efficiency. Of course, if you really want to implement this properly, um, I think this, uh, the losses in that shield can be controlled by proper segmentation of the shield. Another way to implement the shield is to actually insert it um, in the slots to integrate it almost with uh, the insulation system of the, of the winding. So this is what I've tried to depict here. So it's a slot with the, the main winding, and then the insulation consists of three layers, with the blue being the insulation material, with no mix paper, and in between them, some kind of copper shield. Um, we actually implemented this. We took a machine and we rewound it, and we prepared these special um, insulation material with the shield inside and the connecting wires. So. From a practical perspective, this is not really nice because for each slot you have this wire coming out, which is the ground connection. Um, so it's a lot of additional wiring. Um, but we did see we did see also improvements using using this technique. I think our implementation wasn't perfect, with so the results wasn't as good maybe as we would have liked to see. But we did definitely see an improvement, and I think uh, if a uh, motor manufacturer, for example, want, want to implement something like this, then they'd probably try to, to go for a, a, a clever way of implementing this, the shielding inside the slots. Another, just briefly, I'll describe another um, mitigation strategy that we implemented. So we can see here, um, between the inverter and the machine, we've connected a common mode transformer. And how this works is we take all three leads that we would have connected to the conduction ma induction machine and we run them through a single core together, such that only the common mode current is actually producing flux in the core of the transformer. And on the secondary side, then we can connect the damping resistor. Um, if we design this common, transformer, common mode transformer, um, we must um, consider these things. So the, the bandwidth the, is important. We must design it for high frequencies. This is the, the frequency of the common mode current, typically, in that range. So we can't use just normal laminations for the core. It's typically, typically we have to use ferrite. Um, the primary winding has to carry the full rated current of the, of the machine, but the secondary winding carries very little current. And because of that, and the fact that the core only supports the common mode flux, the, that common mode transformer can be quite compact, also cheaper 
compared to a full-sized uh, isolation transformer. There is uh, how we implemented this. So you can see the common mode transformer there on the left-hand side. And here's some common mode voltage and current waveforms. So again, in blue, it's without the transformer and in green with the transformer. Uh, this is with the machine operating at no load, I think at around about 300 RPM. And uh, you can see a similar step in the common mode voltage. And if you compare at the bottom, there's a large common mode current without the transformer, but it's almost eliminated completely if we have the common mode transformer in the system. Okay, so then some conclusions from this project. Um, we've again con confirmed that electrostatic shielding is a, is a viable strategy to reduce this EDM type of bearing currents. And although the end windings, they do have uh, a, a significant contribution to the shaft voltage, um, if you just shield that reason, it may, may not always be sufficient to eliminate the currents completely. Um, a fully shielded configuration was very effective. And the, the, the shielding inside the slots of the stator is a configuration that is perhaps better suited to, to mass production. Um, the common mode transformer, again, we found that it, it is an effective way to reduce bearing currents. Um, one thing that is important to consider in the design is the bandwidth. The nice thing also about this solution is that it can be retrofitted in existing installations. So if you have some system where you, you know have problems with bearing currents, this is maybe a, a good way to solve that um, in an after-the-fact method. Um, in general, Definitely, I think with the uh, improvements in power electronics, especially, um, higher voltages being switched at, um, and fa at faster and faster all the time, bearing currents, there definitely can be a serious problem. Um, but with a clear understanding of the problem, um, suitable mit mitigation strategies can be implemented. That's my story, thank you. <laughs>